as we're studying 2 Corinthians, but before that, you know that there's 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, you may remember that Paul had chided these people at, at, at the church at Corinth because these Christians, they could only receive what some has called a doctrinal milk instead of spiritual meat. Okay, they've been in church for years and years and years, but they were still just taking milk and they weren't eating what we would call meat and potatoes. But beginning here in chapter 10, Paul the apostle to this church there in Corinth, he serves up what I like to call a heaping plateful of spiritual meat. As he addresses this, this church there in Corinth about spiritual warfare. Now, the title of this morning's message, if you have your outline and you're looking at it, it is this, Satan Flees God's WMDs. Satan Flees God's WMDs. Now, in our world, and because of television and, and satellite and all this and cable and all this of uh, television, we know in our international politics, and we've heard it for a number of years now, that WMDs stands for Weapons of Mass Destruction. That's what we know it as. But the WMDs I want to talk about this morning and I want to share with you this morning, it doesn't stand for weapons of mass destruction. It stands for weapons of mighty demolition. All right? Weapons of mighty demolition. And because the passage that we're going to see here in a few minutes, it says that God's weapons are mighty for the demolition of fortresses and strongholds. Now, I'm going to ask you to please stand with me, as is our custom here, and we do it for the respect of God's Word. That's why if, if somebody ever says to you, why do you people out there at Grace Baptist stand when you read Scripture? It's out of respect for God's Word. That's what it all comes down to. It comes out of Ezekiel, where they were reading the Scripture, and they had the people in the congregation to stand out of respect. And I believe we need to do that today. We need to do that. So turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to look at the first six verses. Now, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and he writes to the church today, and here's what he says. Now, I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walk according to the flesh. Now listen to what Paul says in verse 3. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing that raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And then in verse 6 he says, for we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we've heard your word. Now, Father, I pray that you take away the thoughts and the cares of this world and where we're going to go for lunch and what we're going to do with our family and where we're going to go here and where we're going to go there. And, Father, help us to concentrate on you. Help us to see what Paul the Apostle was telling this church in Corinth. And not only that, Father, but what he's telling us as believers today. Speak to our hearts and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, just a few minutes ago, we sung that song, Victory in Jesus. And I'm here to tell you this morning that if you really want victory in Jesus, there's three things that we must do in regard to what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 10 about fortresses or strongholds. Now, I'm going to use either one of those words, and they're interchangeable. They mean the same thing. All right? So if I say fortresses, don't think, well, wait a minute, what's he talking about? Same thing. Here's the three things. Number one, we need to define what a fortress is or a stronghold. The first definition is this. 
a fortress or stronghold is an, an illegal outpost which the enemy, Satan, has established from where he can repeatedly attack a person at his or her point of weakness. Let me say that one more time. A fortress or a stronghold is an illegal outpost which the enemy, Satan, has established from where he repeatedly attacks a person at his or her point of weakness. Satan will never, ever, please listen, Satan will never, ever attack you where you're the strongest. He will find the chink in your armor, the weakest point in your life, and that's where he attacks. And he just keeps attacking there and keeps attacking there. Now, if you are a Christian, you are, how do I want to say this? You are occupied by the Holy Spirit. You accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit came within you and took up residency in your life. Amen? All right. But down through time, there may be a possibility that the enemy, Satan, may have constructed a fortress in your life and in your mind which he repeatedly attempts you. I'm not saying you're possessed by the devil. Don't get me wrong. You've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You cannot be possessed by Satan. You can be oppressed, but never possessed by Satan if you're a believer in God. But now what Satan can do is he can get in your mind and he can work areas and tempt you and attack you and attack you to where you do fall to that, ten, that temptation, that sin, and you start doing it. And then the next thing you know, folks, listen, the next thing you know, it has become a habit. And you're doing it daily, hourly, whatever. Jesus Christ, over in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10 and verse 10, he, he reveals to us the enemy, Satan's strategy. Here's what he says. He says, the thief, meaning Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. You want to know what Satan wants to do in your life and mine and, other, and the non-believers? He wants to kill us, he wants to steal us from us, and he wants to destroy us. That's what he wants to do. Satan and his demons have targeted you to do this. Christian, listen. He wants to kill your joy. One of the things that Satan cannot stomach is a joyful Christian. And he's going to do everything he can to take your joy away from you. The next thing he's going to do is he's going to steal your blessings. If he can steal blessings from you by you, being, you and I being disobedient to God, he's going to do it. He'll do it. And then thirdly, he's going to destroy your effectiveness for Christ. You've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And boy, you're excited for the Lord. And you're telling other people about Jesus Christ. But you have this one flaw. And Satan just keeps pounding you there. And pounding you there and attacking you there. He's going to continue doing that to your effectiveness for Christ is totally destroyed. That's what he's going to do. The second definition is this. A fortress or a stronghold are patterns of faulty thinking that have become entrenched in your mind. A stronghold or a fortress, they are patterns of faulty thinking that have become entrenched in your mind. As soon as you hear something, as soon as you see something, just like that. That's what you think of. And it's faulty. It's not biblical. That's what he's done. That's what he's done. Now, we know that the mind is the battlefield. And because in verse 5 of our text in 2 Corinthians 10, it speaks of speculations and lofty things raised up against the knowledge of Lord. 
But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, we are doing what? What are we doing? We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You got to take your thoughts captive to Christ. Amen? Because the more you think about something, you're going to do it. What I have witnessed in my lifetime is this. Most people do not go into sin just full bore and jump into it. You know how they do it? They think about it. it it's a moment of thought. And they, they, at first they go, no, no, can't think that way. Can't think that way. Then they have that thought again. And they think, no, I can't think that way. Then they have that thought again. And little by little, Satan just keeps attacking, keeps attacking to where you start entertaining that thought. And then after a period of time, then that's when you do the thought. You do the sin. And that's what Satan does. There are both personal and social fortresses or strongholds. There's both. Racism. When we heard the word racism, racism is, is a social fortress or it can be a personal fortress. And, and, and racism is based on the sinful, faulty speculation that there are some races superior than others. That's what racism is. A perfect example of that is in 1932 with Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was Australian. Austrian, I mean, not Australian. He was Austria. But he was German. That was his thinking. And he thought that the German people were superior to the Jewish people. Right? You know your history. So he kept thinking on that. German people are superior to the Jewish people. So what, end, what ends up happening? He ends up with a full-blown hatred for anybody that's Jewish. And then that's not bad enough. He puts them in the ghettos, takes them out of their homes, puts them in the ghettos, into the slums of the cities. And then he not only puts them, that's not enough because of his hatred keeps growing and that his, his race is superior. Then he puts them in the concentration camps. Then that's not enough because his race is superior to their race. So what does he do? By the end of World War II, he is exterminated. He has killed six million Jewish people. That's what racism can do. If you're my age or a little bit older, maybe even a little bit younger, you'll remember right in our own country in the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s with racism. Racism is both a social and a personal fortress. Let's try another that's both personal and social fortress. Believing in astrology. If you believe that the location of the stars and the planet has something to do in your life, whether you do this, go there, do that, marry this person, not marry that person, get this job, don't get that job. If you do that, folks, listen, that is a faulty thought process beginning way back by Satan and he builds it into your mind. I know well-meaning Christians, folks. Listen, I know well-meaning Christians, and boy, I don't like saying this, but they will not make a move in life until they read their horoscope. That is a faulty way of thinking. Okay? That thinking... I'm going to say this, and I say it with all the love in my heart. That style of thinking is nothing but from the pits of hell. That's all it is. That's all it is. If you're saying that star or that planet is in control of your life, guess what you just did? You just removed Jesus Christ out of being in control of your life. And you said, oh, this planet and these stars, boy, when they align, I, I need to do this and I need to do that. You just took Jesus off the throne and put those stars and those planets on the throne. 
And basically, you're saying the stars and the planet are in control of your life and not God. And that's a faulty way of thinking. Now, we've defined fortresses, our stronghold. I've given you two. Number two is this. Identify your fortresses. Identify those fortresses in your life. There are so many fortresses or strongholds that I don't have the time this morning or, or any day to mention all of them. Okay? There's, just, there's bunches of them. But I am going to do this, and you hold on because we're going to put it in top speed. I'm going to give you fortresses from A to Z. Don't even try to write them down. You may get some, but you're not going to get them all. Here we go. Ready? From A to Z. Anger, bitterness, compulsive behavior, despair, eating disorder, fear, greed, impatience, a judgmental spirit, keeping grudges, hypocrisy, legalism, materialism, a constant need of approval, a obsessive behavior, Pornography, a quarrelsome spirit, revenge, constant self-pity, temper issues, an unforgiving spirit, a violent nature, worry, xenophobia, and that's just mean you're, you fear strangers, people you don't know. Yoga on the spiritual side. I'm not doing, talking about yoga, the exercise. I'm talking about yoga on the spiritual side. And Z, I misplaced zeal. How do you like that? From A to Z. From A to Z. Now, that is not an exhaustive group or list. There's many, many more. And if we're honest with ourselves and we will admit that there is an area in our lives in which we seem to fail over and over again, you're at your beginning. Our desire is to live righteously, but it seems as if someone evil is perched on a high wall and like a sniper, they just keep taking pot shots at us when it comes to that area. You have an area in your life and you have victory over it. Victory in Jesus. And praise God. I've overcome it through the help of the Lord. I'm done. I don't do that anymore. I don't think that anyway. But here's this other. And boy, just when you think through the help of the Holy Spirit that you've overcame that thing, there's that shot in the dark again. And it's just like that sniper sitting up on that wall and he's watching you. And he waits for the opportune time and he takes that pot shot at you. That's what it is. If there is a weakness or a recurring sin in your life, okay, if there's a weakness or a recurring sin in your life, we should consider that that is a possibility, that that is a spiritual fortress. If there's that area where you're always failing at, stop and consider that that may be a spiritual fortress that has been planted there by Satan. Now I'm going to say this to you. Coming to the realization that, that you have that fortress, it's there in your life, it's, that's good. Because only when you identify that fortress in your life or my life can you or I prepare to do battle against it. If you and I go around the, go from day to day saying, I have no problems in my life, I'm okay. From the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed, even my dreams are perfect, they're good, they're, they're, they're spiritual, they're fantastic. I have no shortfalls in my life. Folks, you're just fooling yourself. You're just fooling yourself. But when we come to the realization that I have a problem in my life, and it's this, you're on the road. You're on the road. You've identified it. Now, I believe in the process of identifying this fortress, this stronghold, there, again, there's three things that we need to do. The first thing we need to do is gather intelligence about that fortress. We need to gather intelligence about that fortress. Why, why, why is it there? Why do I constantly do this? It's like when you're in the military. In the military, you attend classes on the importance of gathering information, gathering that intel. 
about your enemy before you launch an attack. It is, it's extremely dangerous to attack the enemy, Satan, before you know everything about him and that, that weakness, that, that fortress in your life and mine. And once you've identified your fortress, then you start the process of learning all you can about it. Why do I have those thought patterns? Why am I constantly falling to that temptation? The second thing you need to do is this. You need to cut off the supply line to the fortress. You need to cut off the supply line to the fortress. In ancient times, whenever a, an attacking army approached a fortress, you're in the fortress, you've built this, this wall, and here comes the enemy. The best way for the enemy to conquer is to simply lay siege to it and cut off the supply line. The attacking army would not allow food or water to be carried into the fortress, into that city, and pretty soon those inside, the, the soldiers and the people inside, are going to do what? They're going to be forced to surrender. So whatever your weakness is, find out where it's coming from and cut off the supply line. Starve it out. God says over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, flee youthful lust. That means sometimes the best thing for you to do is run away from it. When I was part of a military, uh, an Air Force base ministry, and we had some young guys that had accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they had different problems in their lives before accepting Christ, you know that that's going to be a fortress. Satan is going to keep attacking on that. And we would tell these guys, if you catch yourself in a situation and Satan is attacking you repeatedly in that area that used to be a part of your life and you didn't think anything of it until you became a Christian and he's attacking you, run. Get out of your room, go to some of these other men, and, men and, that are Christians and go to them, knock on their door, get them out of bed, I don't care, and tell them, say, listen, I need you to pray with me because I am being severely tempted by Satan to fall into this sin. I said, more than likely, they will, they will pray with you. Romans chapter 13 and verse 14 tells us, make no provisions for the flesh to its lust. Make no provisions. Cut it off. Now, what does that mean? Simply, it means this. If your fortress, if, if the thing that Satan tempts you with constantly, day in and day out, let's say it's alcohol. What that means is you should not hang around out in places where other, everybody else in that place is drinking. You'll eventually order that drink. And you'll drink it. And if you have trouble with alcohol, you know and I know all it takes is one drink. And you're back there. You're back there. If your fortress is gambling, what does it mean? It means you should not hang out in places where there's gambling going on. And you could go on down the list. If one of your fortresses before Jesus, what I refer to as B.C., before Christ, is, say, cussing. You used to use every foul language that you could think of, and you probably made some up. If that is your weakness before Christ, and you're hanging around with somebody, man or woman, and all they do is curse day in and day out, every conversation, every other word is a curse word, this is hard, folks, I know. Quit hanging around that person. Start praying for them, but quit hanging around them. That's what I mean by cutting off the supply line. You just don't do it anymore. The next thing is this. Enlist a group of fellow warriors. Enlist a group of fellow warriors. 
whether in the Bible or in secular history, have you ever heard of someone going against a castle alone, attacking a castle alone? Never. Never. Whether it's in secular history or biblical history, if there is an attack, you don't attack it by yourself. You have fellow warriors to attack it with you. The, the, one of the most important things I can tell you this morning about fortresses and, and, and strongholds and when you're fighting them is this. Don't try to do it by yourself. Don't try to attack that fortress by yourself or that stronghold by yourself. You know why that is? You're going to fail. You're going to fail. The best place to find fellow soldiers is right here in your family of believers, family of faith. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who are, are ready to stand with you and help you to demolish those fortresses. All you have to do is go to them and say, I have this problem. I have this reoccurring temptation from Satan and I keep falling to it. I need your help. I need you to pray for me. I need you to stand with me. If I call you at 2 a.m. in the morning and I'm being attacked by Satan, I need to have, have the assurance from you that I can call you on the phone and say, I'm being tempted. Talk to me. Pray with me. And for the most part, another believer in Christ will say, you better believe I will. I'll do it. Number three, attack fortresses with God's weapons. Now, we've identified and we've, are, are, we've defined what a fortress is, right? We've defined a stronghold. Then we talked about identifying that fortress. We know what it is. Now we've identified it. Now you need to attack the fortress. When you've defined it and identified it, you're now ready to attack the fortress. Paul writes that weapons we fight with are mighty unto God for the demolishing of fortresses. See, that's why I call them God's WMDs. Okay? Because they're mighty in demolishing these fortresses. Before a soldier, a military person, goes into battle, they become so familiar with their weapons that they can dismantle those things and reassemble those things with either their eyes shut or totally in the dark. They know their weaponry. They know it so well. They know it so well, like I said, they can either take it apart or put it back together with their eyes closed or in the dark. We have to do the same thing. Now, quickly, let's look over the weapons that we have as Christians over our, at our disposal. First, we have protective we weapons. The armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible tells us that it is important to put on the full armor. Notice what I said? The full armor of God. Not part of it, all of it. You got to have it all on. Five of the armors of God mentioned in Ephesians 6 are, are defensive, are for protection. First, you put on the belt of truth. A soldier's belt is, is part that holds a variety of other important weapons to, and gear together. Without that belt, you can't carry a lot of stuff. Number two, you must put on, it says, the breastplate of righteousness. In today's term, in the military, that would be like you or I putting on what they call a Kevlar bulletproof vest. So Satan cannot penetrate and hit your heart. Number three, we are to put on the boots of readiness, the battle boots, to carry the gospel of peace to every person in every place. You got to have your boots on. Okay? You got to have them on, man. I knew guys that served in Vietnam. You don't run around Vietnam without your boots on. World War II in Korea, you didn't run around with your boots off. You had your boots on. 
You've got to have them on to go from place to place. Number four, it says, take up the shield of faith. That is to deflect the fiery attacks of Satan. You've got to defend yourself from them. Number five, it says, put on the helmet of salvation. That is to protect your mind from the enemy's attack. But in ancient times, here's something else. See, it, it not only, that helmet not only protects your mind from Satan's attack, the enemy's attack, but in ancient times, here's something else about that helmet. And I didn't know this until some years ago when I finally started studying about helmets a little bit. In battle, in ancient times, that helmet identified what side of army you were on. Okay? It helped identify... Oh, you're on Team A because you have this kind of helmet. So you, if you're on Team A, you don't hit your other, your, your partner. Because you look at the helmet, oh, his helmet's like my helmet, so we're together. I don't hit him. I don't attack him. So our helmet also identifies us as soldiers of the cross, soldiers of Jesus. But we're not just talking about defensive and defending ourselves. We're talking about, about attacking. So we need to learn about our, our offensive weapons. Now, it's great to study the defensive weapons, but I'd love to study and to, and to think about those offensive weapons. In this passage of Scripture, Paul mentions weapons, plural. We're not limited to just one weapon. And this morning, I want to share with you a couple kind of those WMDs of God's. In chapter 6, still in chapter 6 of Ephesians, we hear of the first uh, offensive weapon, and that is the spirit of the word, the inspired word of God. That's the sword of the spirit. It's this thing. All 66 of them. Called the Holy Bible. Right? Amen? Amen? All right. Did you ever think of this? You remember when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, the enemy, the arch enemy? You remember that? And, and Satan tempted him in, in, in three different areas, right? What did Jesus say to him? He said, it is written. Ever think of that? It is written, Jesus said to Satan. Jesus was quoting Scripture to Satan. He was quoting Scripture to him. It is written, you can't do this and you shouldn't do that, right? You worship the Lord your God and only Him and all the rest. Now, when Satan tacked Jesus, and Jesus was weak, right? He'd been fasting without food or water. He was in a weak state. Satan attacks him. Jesus goes to the Word. When you and I are being attacked by Satan, where should we go? To the Word of God. You're being attacked, and you know you're being attacked by Satan, you find scripture in that area of your life that is a weak point, and you say, Satan, it is written. And if you can't memorize it, read it to him. Okay? And what happens? He has to leave. He left Jesus. You're employing the same tactics that our Lord and our Savior did by the Spirit of, by the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. So guess what? He's got to leave you too. There are two different kinds of words that are used to describe the Word of God in the New Testament. The one is a word that means the written Word of God, the written Word of God, as, as you sit and read it or I sit and read it. The other Hebrew word has the definition where we get the living applied Word of God. See, it's one thing for you and I to sit and read this Holy Scriptures. We can do that all day long, can't we? And enjoy it. Learn some history. Learn some things. But the difference is applying it. There is the difference. 
You've read the Word of God. Now you say, hmm, I'm being attacked in this area. And Scripture says, if I do this, I won't be attacked. Satan will have to flee God's WMDs. So you take that scripture and you apply it to your life. And Satan has to flee. That's the one. The other thing is this. The other offensive weapon is this. It is the spirit-inspired prayer. Spirit-inspired prayer. The Bible says, and pray in the Spirit. I've been doing a study here for the last three, four weeks, five weeks, I don't know how long, from the book of Ezekiel, and I've now gotten into Daniel. I was sharing this earlier in the Sunday school hour. Daniel. Who was a man of prayer. What a man of prayer. Daniel was in one position in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is starting his prayer. And before Daniel even finishes the prayer, before Daniel says, Amen. God in heaven sends Gabriel to Daniel and says, get down there, here's the prophecy, tell it to him, show it to him, I'm answering his prayer. Daniel was not even at the point of saying amen. You've heard the term a prayer warrior? Folks, listen, that was Daniel. Daniel prayed, and he knew how to pray. And he did it. We need to pray. In other words, prayer is us, is the attack itself. Prayer is the attack itself. It's not you and I going out and in the flesh. It's us going out in prayer mentally to the attack of that fortress. Most mature Christians today have learned that the greatest battles in their lives are either lost or won on their knees in prayer. And that's the truth. Now the next element that we need to see is this. Okay, we've had the weapons, the defensive, the offensive. Now we need to learn something about what is called strategic mission. You know what the strategic mission is with spiritual warfare? It's to, lim to liberate thought patterns that have become prisoners of war in your mind and bring them back into obedience to Christ where you don't have that thought pattern anymore. You've released the captives. You've released it. That stronghold. You have the definition of a fortress or a stronghold. You've defined and you've identified that stronghold in your life. And through the word of God and through prayer, you attack. And you liberate it. You set the captive free. If there's a fortress in your life, the only way to know for sure if it has been demolished is when you start thinking differently about that sin. That's when you have it. You have a fortress in your life, you must agree with God that it's sin and it's wrong, and instead of trying to justify it, you try to get, you get rid of it through prayer and the Word. And if you're struggling with one of those many fortresses, like I mentioned, A through Z, you must understand, you and I must understand that Satan tries to make you think that it's harmless and that everybody else is doing it, so don't worry about it. It's okay. See, that's what Satan tells us. Well, everybody's doing it. 
it won't hurt you. As long as you're not hurting anybody else, it's okay, he says. But again, my friend, that is a lie from the pits of hell. Because it is harming somebody. And when we start thinking that it doesn't harm anybody or hurt anybody, he has captured your mind like a prisoner of war. But with God's weapons, you can, you can storm those mental fortresses or strongholds, tear it down, and recapture those thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. Now, let's wrap this up. Let me leave you with this. When we think of strongholds or fortresses and when we primarily pray about these things, these fortresses or strongholds, these faulty thinkings in our minds to be demolished. We, we normally pray for ourselves, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. We need to do that. We need to pray that through God's WMDs, we destroy those fortresses, that faulty way of thinking in our own lives. But let me challenge you this this morning. We need to pray for our nation. We've got some fortresses, we've got some strongholds in this wonderful nation of ours called the United States of America that folks, Satan has planted from the pits of hell and we need to knock them down. And we can only do it through, his, through the word of God and inspired praying. We have them in churches. Now I'm getting personal. We have fortresses and we have strongholds in the church of Jesus Christ today that we need to bust down. And there's also in other, other people. Your family members, my family members, your friends, my friends, they have fortresses and strongholds that we need to pray for them that God will help them to destroy those fortresses. Now don't miss this. We need to pray long and hard, okay, just like old Daniel. We need to pray long and hard that the people of St. Genevieve, Missouri, the United States would repent of their sins and that they would turn and change their way of thinking and turn back to God. We should pray that the fortresses of abortion should be demolished. We should pray that God... To God, that sexual perversion, and you see it on TV all the time, you hear about it on TV or the radio all the time, that sexual perversion would be removed from our nation. We should pray that God would break down the fortresses of pornography. We should pray that the fortresses of racism and all the other fortresses would be abolished and that our country would turn back to Almighty God. Amen? That's what we need to do. Can it happen? I believe it can. I know some pastors, I know some people that would say, oh, it's too late. It's never too late. It's never too late. Not with God. <laughs> it may be on the human thinking, but it's never too late with God. We need to do it. And folks, let me tell you this. God never intended that the church of Jesus Christ be a place where Christians should come and hide from that big bad world. God has called his church to be soldiers marching to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Somebody will write that into a song. I believe they have. James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and what will devil, the devil do? He will flee from you. So church, and I'm not just talking about grace, Baptist. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. Let's get ready for battle. Let's take the sword of the Spirit and pray in the Spirit and attack. And I believe, I know it, I trust it, I'm a sure of it, that when we do, we will see those fortresses in our lives, in our country, in our families, 
in our town, in our state, be destroyed. And they'll come crumbling down. And God will have a mighty victory. And you know what else? Just like that song we sung a little earlier, we'll have victory in Jesus. Because Satan, listen, I'm closing with this. Satan must flee God's WMDs. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We know in our own lives that we have fortresses and strongholds. We know in our families, Father God, they have fortresses and strongholds. We know in our churches and in our towns and in our state and in all 50 states, Father, and in our nation that equals up to our nation, we have fortresses and we have strongholds and they need to be busted down. They need to be demolished. We, we have learned the definition of a fortress. We need to identify that fortress. And then through the weaponry of the full armor of God, we need to attack. Through prayer and the Holy Scripture of God. And when we do that, we will see those fortresses, those strongholds, crumble. As the title of the message says, because Satan must flee God's WMDs. Father, speak to people. Speak to their hearts. Minister to them, Father. Lead us and guide us in your way and help us to bring you honor, to bring you glory. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to ask you to please stand and turn in your...